uh, Gujarat High Court Advocates Association. And though otherwise I had congratulated him, but on this platform, I congratulate on behalf of Beyond Law CLC and its viewers. Because we know that a leader is one who can lead from the front. And for leading, you also have to, especially for a lawyer, how to go about the drafting. And I was just reading one of the articles that said for understanding the drafting and arguments, three facets would always come, come into the mind. First is you have to read a lot. Then you have to crystallize your thoughts, how you have to synchronize with them. And then being a lawyer, needless to say that the understanding of the statutes, regulations, and how the law has developed is must. Because in one of the webinars where we did with Mr. Uday Hula, senior advocate and former advocate general, right. he also right. hammered this point to the effect that if you know the particular law or the amendment in the statute or act, then you draft in such a fashion while he was giving a reference to the specific relief act. And that's how the law travels, I would say, to the effect that if there is change and you continue to harp upon an issue which is no longer relevant, or you are relying upon a law which is what you say, it could be an arbiter or it could have been an oral judgment. The entire foundation lies upon that. Right. But right. today's session is art of drafting on the suits and the red petitions. Because normally what we believe or what books normally come in the market also or on the social media platform where we find number of notes, it only speaks of drafting. But is there any stark difference between the two? Is there any difference between the mindset which has to be developed for that? Is this their way to pen down those thoughts in a different fashion and way? These were are the certain differences and nuances which we will learn today's through the today's webinar's journey. And we now always have Q&A as normal in the format we have. And those who want to know the previous webinars of Mr. Asim Pandya, they can Google it on the YouTube. Or if they have subscribed to the channel of Beyond Law CLC, they will find the different sessions taken by Mr. Pandya. Without taking much time, being a weekend, I would request Mr. Pandya to take things forward. Thank you very much, Mr. Vikas. Good evening to everyone who is present in this webinar. It is indeed my pleasure being here again after a very long time to share my views on the art of drafting and point out the basic distinctions between drafting of a plaint and drafting of a petition. Now, friends, you all are aware that advocacy Advocacy consists of two basic skills. One is your writing skill and another is your oratory. Unless you possess both these skills, it is difficult to make a mark in the profession. So to be a successful lawyer, it is necessary to possess these two skills. And if you do not possess these skills, then by your own efforts, you will have to acquire these two skills. So basically, when the topic is the art of drafting, so as you know that this is an art, I can start with the proverb that I can take the horse to the river, but I cannot make him drink the water. So same is with the art, any art, you take any art. If I give a simple comparison of the drafting with the art of painting. So for painting, what you need basically? You need a pencil. You need a canvas. You need colors. And after you possess all these tools, then what is most important is your own skill, your own imagination, how to make what kind of drawing which will attract the eyes of people. So same thing is there with the drafting of a pleading or a petition. I can provide you basic tools of drafting. I can provide you the structure of drafting, but I cannot see it in your mind and dictate what is to be written in the draft or a written in petition or a plane. 
so i will today try to first discuss all these things about what is the nature of this skill how one can possess this kind of skill what are the tools basic school uh, tools of this uh, dra uh, drafting skill and then also what is the importance of drafting because first of all we need to know the importance of the drafting unless and until we realize the importance of the drafting you will not be able to have liking for the drafting and first and foremost requirement of a good draftsman is to have a great liking for the subject so in this context as i begin with the uh, statement that you need to possess two skills and uh, one is oratory and one is writing skill we are not going to talk about the oratory but i must recommend all of you to refer to one judgment of the honorable supreme court wherein honorable justice krishna here has very vividly discussed the importance of the oral argument in the court hearing and also the written brief so both this uh, important things they he has discussed and he has discussed this in the judgment which is uh, entitled as pn eshwara ayer versus rajesthar supreme court of india which is reported in air 1980 supreme court page 808 i must give brief background so that you can understand the importance of these two skills it was a case wherein virus of one supreme court rule was challenged wherein during hearing of the review petition the oral arguments in the court proceedings are excluded so today also in supreme court of india whenever you file a review petition under article 137 of the constitution of india the review petition is circulated in the chambers and thereafter discussion take place between the judges who had decided the case and oral argument in the court room is excluded only of all the judges are of the view that this case needs to be heard in open court then only the matter is placed for oral hearing and arguments so the rule excluded oral arguments while hearing the review petition so validity was challenged and great emphasis was laid on the argumentation skill that it is very important in uh, judicial dispensation and uh, dispensation of justice and therefore you cannot exclude the oral arguments uh, even while hearing the review petition at that stage the honorable justice krishna ayer said that you cannot overrate the importance of oral argument and un underrate the importance of a written brief a blend of both is the best so here i would request all of you to read this judgment because it gives a great insight into the aspect of importance of a written brief also so with this uh, prefatory remarks i will now try to explain what kind of draftings usually a lawyer is supposed to undertake it depends on the first of all it depends upon the place where he has decided to practice so first of all there are three kinds of drafting first drafting is drafting of legal documents convincing that is the job of the non litigation lawyer or solicitors so we are really not concerned with the drafting of documentations the second aspect of the drafting is drafting of pleadings so pleading means necessarily the pleadings to be presented in a court or a judicial before the judicial authority and third kind of drafting is drafting of legislations so here also we are not really concerned with the subject drafting of legislation so our focus would be essentially on the drafting of pleadings why i am referring to this kind of uh, three three types of drafting is to explain to you that the drafting skill differs from the place where you practice suppose if you are practicing in a subordinate court what kind of drafting you will be required to undertake then if you are practicing on civil side in the trial court then first thing which you are required to draft is a drafting of 
uh, notice. Second is notice is most important document, and I suggest that one must take maximum care while drafting a notice because it is going to be a base of your plane. And once if you miss certain aspects in the legal notice which has preceded the filing of the plane, it is not necessary that in every case the legal notice must precede the filing of the plane. But usually our experience shows that before filing a suit, usually party exchanges a notice and reply. And thereafter, when the dispute is not resolved by issuing this notice and reply, then ultimately parties approach the civil court with a plane. So while drafting a legal notice, it is most important that you take utmost care so that nothing, no facts are missed, no important event is missed, no important document, a reference of that document is missed while issuing a notice. Because when you draft a plane and something is not stated in your original legal notice and it is found in the plane, then immediately when defendant files his written statement, he will make a UN cry that you are trying to improve upon this story. What you have not stated in the legal notice, you cannot incorporate in this. So you are improving the story. You ought to have stated all these things in the legal notice, but you have failed to do. And therefore, this is an improvement and it is an afterthought. And therefore, in written statement, the, uh, the defendant would say that court should not believe this. So this is this kind of then plaint comes. So under the civil procedure court, Pleading simply means plaint and written statement. So if you choose to practice in the trial court, you will have to undertake drafting of a legal notice, plaint. If you are appearing for the defendant, then you will have to draft a written statement. Then also, uh, also interlocutory applications like application for injunction, application for appointment of commissioner, and then many other miscellaneous applications will have to be drafted by you. So this is the nature of drafting which you would be required to undertake if you choose to practice in the trial court. In addition, if you are practicing in a district court also, then you also need to learn drafting of appeals, drafting of revisions, because there are certain orders that may not be possible to be revised, uh, can be, uh, cannot be appealed. And therefore, in a given case, you are entitled to file revision also under, under certain statutes. So when if you are practicing in a district court, you will have to uh, uh, you will have to acquire the skill of drafting of appeals, revisions, review appeal from orders of miscellaneous appeals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you choose to practice in high court, then what would be the nature of drafting which will come to you? There, if you choose to practice in high court, then the documents which you will have to draft is a petition under Article 226, petition under Article 227, first appeals arising under Section 96, second appeal under Section 100, appeal from order in many, uh, sometimes appeal from order also under Order 43, Rule 1. There are special statutes that also provide for filing appeal before the High Court, references under a special statute. So if you choose to practice in High Court, you will have to undertake this kind of drafting and uh, many a time review petitions also. If you choose to practice in Supreme Court, in addition to uh, the regular drafting of Article 32 of the Constitutional Petition under Article 32 of the Constitution of India, you will be required to draft special new petitions. Then appeals under the provisions of Article 131 to Article 136 review petitions, etc. The skill or art of drafting differs from every place. Suppose, as I said, that if you choose to practice in civil court, you would be required to apply a different technique and different skill. So we would, we will, I will be dealing with the tools of drafting a little later. But this is the area and it depends on where you choose to practice and you must try to possess this kind of uh, skill. And you, if you are not possessing this skill, then you must acquire this kind of skill, depending on the place where you choose to practice. So this is one aspect. Now, most fundamental aspect is what is the meaning of drafting? I have tried to define the word drafting in my own way. I, I, I would like to define the 
term drafting by stating this that drafting is an art drafting is an art of articulating drafting is an art of articulating or arranging the scattered thoughts and writing them down writing them down in a systematic manner so as to make the written text intelligible so you follow what is what is the division this definition will give you some insight that first of all it is an art or it is a skill and what is this art about it is an art of articulating your scattered thoughts because before you start dictating any petition plain etc or writing the plain you need to articulate or arrange your scattered thoughts focus on the thoughts and then uh, write them down write them down in not haphazard manner it is to be written down in a systematic manner now then what then it should be written in a manner which will make the written text intelligible so if you write one fact here and another fact there one date here and another date there and in haphazard if you draft something it cannot be defined as a proper drafting or a legal drafting in true sense it would be considered as a slip shot drafting so this is the definition of the word drafting and when we talk about the drafting in the legal field then it would mean drafting in the legal field would mean drafting of a document legal document or a pleading from the facts collected from the client so whatever facts you have collected from the clients so it is making a document or drawing a document or a pleading from the facts collected from the client then information you already possess by applying your common sense your knowledge of law and applying your skill so this is how we understand the drafting of a pleading or a legal document in the field of law so this with this and now what is the meaning of pleading because while discussing discussing this topic we must know all these things so what does pleading means pleading means pleading is a document legal document which is usually presented to a court or a tribunal or a judicial authority wherein a party sets forth his case cause of action and other relief so basically pleading would literally means where party has party to the litigation sets forth his case cause of action and relief and it also includes the assertions allegations defenses and denials in cpc drafting as i said that drafting has been defined to mean that drafting of a plain and written statement only so this is the meaning of the term drafting drafting of a legal document and draft uh, and meaning of the word pleading when we are talking about this topic the art of drafting and we are talk, going to talk about the distinctions between drafting of a plaint and drafting of a petition we first must understand what is the importance of drafting in the legal process or adjudicatory process so first important fact about drafting is that it gives a fair notice to the other side what is the case of the respective party to the litigation so it is first principle of natural justice that if you are coming before the court the other side must know what is the case you are pleading so it gives a fair notice to the parties to the litigation about individual case second importance of the drafting is that it narrows down the controversy when something is stated in writing there is a clear thought expressed in the form of writing so it brings clarity and it once the document brings clarity it automatically narrows down the controversy so it, it helps the judicial authority to adjudicate 
the case most effectively. So that is another importance of the, the uh, drafting of a pleading. Third important aspect about the drafting of pleading or drafting is that um, usually in the trial court, the judges may not read the plaints at their home because the entire system of filing of plaint, filing of written statement is materially different from filing of a petition, etc. in the high court. But so far as the high court judges and Supreme Court judges are concerned, the petitions filed by the litigants or lawyers reach the home of the judge concerned on a previous night before the listing of a case. And the judges do read all these petitions at home. So this gives an opportunity to judges to form a tentative opinion from your pleadings itself. So it has a great importance so far as the lawyers practicing in the high court and Supreme Courts are concerned. Because most of the judges read all the cases when on a previous night and when the matters are listed on the next day and when the advocates are asked to begin his argument, a very brief hearing is given. So a tentative opinion which is formed by a judge from reading of the file, it becomes difficult for a lawyer when he gets up for argument to change that opinion. So if drafting is it's a well-drafted petition, then he should not worry. And if he has made his case very clear in his petition, then judge might form a positive opinion. But if it is a slipshod drafting, if it makes the uh, task of a judge difficult to understand the controversy, then there are all possibilities that your petition might be dismissed. So it uh, gives an opportunity to the judge to form a tentative opinion. And, and when you get up for argument, it would be little difficult for you to change the tentative opinion. So it is very important that your drafting is proper. The next importance of the drafting is that usually in trial court, the, the issues are framed from the drafting, drafting of pleadings, that plaint and written statement. And sometimes documents are also important for framing of an issue. So when something is lacking in drafting, suppose in the plaint you have not made, uh, you have not set out material facts then it is quite likely that a judge may miss to frame an important issue because the judges, the jurisdiction of a judge to frame issue would arise from the fact set out in the plaint and the defenses or denials taken by the defendant in his written statement. So basically from the plaint and written statement, the judge is supposed to frame issues. And if your pleadings are not proper, your plaint is not properly drafted, if, if your written statement is not properly drafted, then it will, it is, it is, it might happen that judge would miss important issue and parties will also not be enabled to focus as to what are the real and genuine issues before the court. And once that happens, for all time to come, it would be absolutely impossible to cure this defect. Because you are all aware that if something is not set out in your pleading, the court will not permit you to travel beyond your pleadings. So once for all, once, for all, once your pleadings are over, the parties will not be allowed to travel beyond what has been set out in the pleadings, that is plain, or a petition, or a written statement, or in a reply to the petition. So that is a very great uh, significance with regard to the drafting of plaint and petition. Then another important aspect, uh, important aspect about drafting is that court will not grant relief which is not prayed for or which is not backed by sufficient pleading. You might, uh, you might draft a prayer, but if there is no supporting or uh, the prayer is not backed by sufficient pleading, then court will not be able to grant you the relief which has been prayed for. And one such occasion happened. In the case of uh, Prabodh Verma 
versus uh, state of UP, which is reported in AIR 1985, Supreme Court, page 167. In that case, a validity of an ordinance or a statute was challenged. And the petition uh, drafted by a lawyer sought for a writ of certiorari to quash that notification. And the Supreme Court deprecated the practice of slipshod drafting and made very important observations. I will reproduce those observations. And Supreme Court in that judgment said that this prayer was not properly drafted. It was not happily drafted. The party should have a declaration that this uh, statute is invalid, void ab initio. And thereafter, he was seeking certain further direction. Then he, he ought to have demanded read in the nature of mandamus, directing the authority from acting or implementing this state statute. The Supreme Court said in 1985 that ill-drafted petition has become the rule and well-drafted petition an exception. And the Supreme Court went on and further said that ill-drafted pleading is an offspring of the union of carelessness with imprecise thinking. And their brothers are slip short preparation of a case, rambling and irrelevant arguments in the judicial proceeding in court proceedings, which results into waste of precious judicial time, which cannot be afforded by the court, which is flooded with skyrocketing dockets. So these are the observations of the Supreme Court that uh, it leads to irrelevant arguments, irrelevant and rambling arguments, and it, it leads to waste of precious judicial time. And therefore, lawyers should be careful while drafting a petition, and he should make all endeavor to bring clarity into his pleading so that judge and the opponent can understand, opponent can reply to his pleadings properly, and judge can decide the case properly. So even 1985, the Supreme Court has taken note of ill-drafted petition. And the, even today, the situation has not unfortunately improved. Even when we see drafting of petitions or a plaint coming from the trial court, then we realize that they are not properly drafted, happily drafted. And therefore, there is a need to acquire this skill so that judicial time is not wasted and the controversies are adjudicated effectively in a short span. So this is the importance of the drafting. And now coming to the tools, because I, as I said, the drafting is a skill or is an art. So I can provide you the structure. I can provide you in bullet points what are the tools for drafting but I cannot make you draft a particular petition because when you join the profession or if you are in a profession, you will have a variety of cases. So even if I explain you that how to draft a one kind of particular petition or a one kind of particular plane, it will not help you in improving the drafting skill. It will simply give you a ready format that for this kind of petition or this kind of relief, in a plane, this is the manner in how the plane is to be drafted. But that will not help you in any manner because during the profession, we'll come across thousands of different cases. And in each case, you will be required to apply different drafting tactic, uh, technique and your drafting skill in a different manner. So basically, for good drafting, what is most, most important? So I will talk about the tools of good drafting because as I said that I will not be able to take you to the actual drafting. I can provide you structure and I can provide you tools, but then ultimately it is your imagination which will have to be applied and create a best draft. So the first important tool in the uh, for drafting is your linguistic skill. You should have a great command of English language if you are practicing in high court and if you are to draft your pleading in English. 
if you are practicing in a subordinate code and uh, your language is hindi then you should have a good command of language and uh, you should uh, write it very clearly so command of language is most essential then what is another important tool another important tool is vocabulary you need to have a great vocabulary to convey your thoughts lord denning said that words are the lawyer's tools of trade for other profession there may be different kind of tools but for our profession what are the tools of trade so lord denning said the words are lawyer's tools of trade and their importance lies in the fact their importance lies in the fact that they are the vehicles of thought so through words we convey our idea we convey our feeling and that is most important in legal profession and in practice so choosing a wrong word lead to a dismissal of your petition also i will give you one example or two examples that how choosing of a wrong word creates lots of difficulty first i will give one illustration of a judge in our high court he had great dislike for the word obtain whenever if you say in his court that uh, my learned friend has obtained the order or i have obtained the order of injunction from the trial court he would say that you cannot obtain the order he had in his mind that word obtain only denotes that it is by unfair means obtain would only indicate that you have done something surreptitiously or by unfair means so if you speak a wrong word that is it is not a wrong word in true sense but there are liking and dislikings for uh, with individual judge and he has a great dislike like, disliking for this word that is obtain so if you speak in his court this word obtain then your case is dismissed so a wrong choosing of a word leads to dismissal of a petition and coincidentally one day while appearing though i was conscious that he does not like this word inadvertently i spoke that word that uh, we have obtained this order from the trial court and it is still continuing so please continue the interim relief and he got annoyed and he said that mr don't use this word obtained then i had looked into the dictionary meaning and then on the next date when the matter was listed i pointed out the dictionary meaning and i i also pointed out that in 80 supreme court judge, judgments the word obtain has been used by the supreme court itself to indicate that obtain does not always mean by unfair means or surreptitious manner it means that by making conscious efforts by efforts you have been able to get the interim injunction because these are discretionary relief it is not given as a matter of right it is not given as a matter of course and therefore an individual lawyer will have to make great efforts in getting injunction in petition even getting a notice issued a lawyer has to make lots of efforts because it is a discretionary relief and petition can be dismissed on various grounds alternative remedy delay and laches territorial jurisdiction disputed question of facts so unless you cross these hurdles even in high court and supreme court notices are not issued so if in that sense the word obtained has been issued that uh, we have obtained notice from the honorable court it simply means that it is by my efforts i have been in a position to get the order and it does not necessarily mean that is it is always surreptitious manner or unfair means so this is one instance and sometimes you would find that many young lawyers when they start career and they start practicing in high court or trial court then judge puts to uh, puts a query to them or judge judges are expressing their opinion they say that i appreciate sir now there are judges and judges who dislike the word that i appreciate because they say that they have reached this position and who are you to appreciate his uh what is falling from the court so there are judges and judges who dislike so in such courts you should be careful in using the word appreciate also instead of that you can say that yes sir i follow it i understand what is falling from the honorable court but as soon as, as soon as you say that yes sir, sir i appreciate then then you are gone and in a given case the judge might dismiss your case also and third instance of choosing a wrong word is that 
I came across one instance where the uh, this uh, educational tribunal was fond of a good language, and in a uh, proceeding arising of a departmental inquiry, he wanted to convey that the in the departmental proceedings the charge has not been proved. But uh, he was fond of using a good language, so he said that the charge has not been proved to the hilt. So he used the word to the hilt, and that phrase has created a lot of difficulty when the matter reached the High Court, because the tribunal simply wanted that charges have not been proved properly. But when he used this to the hilt, men the other side took an objection that the tribunal. has introduced the standard of proof which is applicable to the criminal proceedings and in departmental proceedings the standard of proof is preponderance of probabilities and not the strict standard of proof and once the tribunal had had used that charge has not been proved to the hilt it means that he has applied the uh, standard of criminal trial and then i had a great time or difficult time to convince the court that to the hilt means that he wanted to say that charge is not sufficiently proved and beyond that he did not want so again i had to look up to the dictionary meaning and then take the dictionary meaning to the court and then i had to convince the court so second important tool is uh, this uh, uh, vocabulary but i would request all the lawyers who are watching this webinar that please choose the word very wisely don't choose improper words because as i said that in choosing of an improper word might lead to dismissal of a petition so second aspect that linguistic skill then vocabulary so as to convey your thoughts properly to the judge concerned effectively third important tool is there has to be a clarity of facts that is most important so while drafting you must have a clarity in thoughts if there is a clarity in thoughts there will be clarity in your writing so somebody has said that obscurity in thoughts will lead to obscurity in speech and writing so you should have a clarity in facts and how do you get this then you will have to make conscious efforts so you will have, when you sit with the client first thing which you must do is to demand documents chronologically arrange them in sequence and once you arrange all these documents and put the case of your client in sequence it will automatically impart great uh, clarity in your mind and once your mind is very clear the drafting becomes very easy so arranging documents and arranging facts in sequence would bring clarity in your thoughts clarity in thinking and then it will lead to uh, best drafting and it will give a clarity to the judge also that what this person wants to convey and what is his case finally so third important tool is clarity in thoughts then what is next important is clarity in law so clarity in law is also very important unless you understand the law understand uh, and apply this law properly to the facts of the case your drafting would not be proper and it will not be uh, it will not appeal to the court so your task is to make the task of the judge very easy the main purpose or object of drafting is to see that your written brief is so clear and so precise that judge gets immediate idea as to what is the controversy and once judge within a very short span gets the complete idea of the controversy it becomes very easy for him to give a clear judgment and uh, maybe if you have written it very clearly then you might get a positive judgment if it is not written properly then it would be a difficult task for the judge and then the respondent or defendant will have to Uh, undertake the task of clarifying all these things and which would result into a uh, waste of judicial time the uh, the next tool which i was talking about is uh, the clarity of thought clarity of uh, facts 
And most important aspect is that you must arrange facts in proper sequence. When you arrange the facts in proper sequence, it, it, it will unravel many important aspects of the litigation. And you would be surprised that many things while reading a case, while taking instruction from client, you have missed and which will be, uh, which will come to your light and you will be able to argue properly and you will be able to state all these things properly in your pleadings. So these are the basic to tools of uh, drafting. As I said that as painter needs a pencil, canvas, paintbrush and colors for making a good draft, uh, ma making a good painting. Similarly, a lawyer needs a clarity of thought, clarity in facts, clarity in law, linguistic skill and good vocabulary. That will make a best draft of a pleading. Now, coming to the next aspect of the distinctions between a petition, drafting of a petition and pleading. Uh, I'm sorry, drafting of a plain. Now, what are fundamental distinctions? There are fundamental distinctions between drafting of a plain and a petition. First important aspect about the distinction is that so far as petitions under Article 226 and 227 are concerned, civil procedure code does not apply. So drafting of a petition need not be strictly in accordance with the provisions of CPC. Whereas if you draft a plain or a written statement, it must be in accordance with the provisions contained in Order 6, Order 7, and Order 8. So there are very important aspects that set out in Order 6, 7, and 8 about drafting of a plain. But basically what I'm trying to point out is that while drafting a petition, CPC does not apply strictly. It serves as a guide. And as repeatedly said by the Supreme Court, then while construing uh, drafting of a petition, you, you cannot mechanically apply the provisions of CPC. They are inapplicable by virtue of explanation to section 141 of the Civil Procedure Code, which specifically excludes applicability of civil procedure to read petitions. So that is first distinction. Now, so far as plaints are concerned, plaint must set out the facts concisely, precisely. And what are the facts? Not irrelevant facts. You are supposed to set out only material facts that are relevant for the controversy. So what is expected under Order 6, Rule uh, Order 6, Order 7, and Order 8 of CPC is that your plaint must set out the facts concisely. It should be divided into small paragraphs and it should give the basic facts and it should give material facts and it should not uh, give irrelevant facts and at the same time it should not conceal the important aspect. So the plaint has to give material facts and it has to be in conformity with order 6, 7 and 8 whereas petition did not be in that way. What is important about plaint and petition distinction is that in plaint you are supposed to set out the facts only whereas in petition you are entitled to set out facts. You are supposed to set out your legal submissions also. And you are also entitled to extract the provisions of law. And you are also entitled to reproduce certain relevant excerpts from the Supreme Court's judgment to substantiate your claim in the petition. Whereas in plain, you are simply supposed to set out the facts. There is no requirement of uh, uh, mentioning the grounds in support of the facts because uh, CPC does not say like that. And, uh, and so if you are referring to a document, you have to briefly set out in the plain the effect of the document. You are not supposed to reproduce the entire document in the plain. And uh, what is the importance of the document? All these things are not to be stated only the effect in brief of the document is to be set out in the plaint. Whereas in a petition, 
you are entitled to even reproduce the document, contents of the document. In plain, it is a uh, doctrine that when you refer to a particular document, it is by reference and incorporation become part of the plain. So the, it need not be reproduced or some substantial portion of document need not be reproduced while drafting a plate, but while drafting a petition, you are, liber you are at liberty to reproduce the relevant paragraphs from the uh, document which you are referring to. Then as I said that in plaint, the most important aspect is valuation. It is most essential aspect and it is a mandatory requirement that you will have to point out what is the value of the suit for the purpose of court fee and jurisdiction. So unless and until these facts are set out, it would be difficult to determine before which court your plaint would go or your suit will go. So that is a mandatory requirement so far as plaints are concerned. But in petition, there is no requirement of making valuation. It is a special jurisdiction under Article 226 where valuation of the petition is absolutely irrelevant. So it is not supposed to be there in petition, but it is in plaint, it is very important. And there has to be a paragraph also, not only in the title, in the plaint, you say that the suit is valued at so and so rupees for the purposes of court fees and jurisdiction, but there has to be a, spe a specific paragraph wherein you will have to state that the in this uh, uh, suit, the uh, plaintiff is seeking washing and setting aside of the sale deed and the sale deed value is rupees 2 crores and therefore for the purposes of court fees and jurisdiction, this is the amount of the court fees payable on this and it has been paid. Otherwise, uh, the uh, assessment will have to take place and the uh, department will decide what is the appropriate court fee and if by chance the valuation goes up, then plate will have to be transferred, will have to be transferred. So that is a requirement so far as plaint is concerned, but there is no requirement so far as petitions are concerned. Now, cause of action. In a plaint, cause of action is most important and it is mandatory requirement for every plaintiff to set out what is the cause of action. Unless and until cause of action is set out clearly in a separate paragraph, it will be difficult to adjudicate whether the a suit is within the limitation or not. So this paragraph will give an idea to the court as well as the department that whether the suit is barred by limitation or not because suits are governed by the law of limitation. So another distinction is that uh, so far as plaints are concerned since they are governed by the law of limitation, there is a specific requirement of setting out the cause of action whereas pet for petitions, it is not required to set out a specific cause of action because petitions are not governed by the law of limitation. It is governed by the principle of delay and leches. That is absolutely a different facet than the time barred claim. So for deciding whether it is time barred or not, one has to give that uh, specific instance that on this day, the agreement for sale was executed on this day. Uh, the plaintiff demanded enforcement of the agreement for sale. The defendant refused on this day. Thereafter, repeated reminders were sent on so and so and so date. But defendant has failed to execute a uh, sale deed in my favor. And therefore, now the present by this suit, we are seeking enforcement, specific performance of the contract. So this will give an idea. So, so far as petitions are concerned, they are not governed by the law of limitation and they, their limitation is flexible. It is a discretionary relief and therefore, suppose a cause of action has arisen, suppose in the month of July 2019. And if you are approaching the High Court in the year 2022, in February 2022, one cannot say that it should be dismissed on the ground that it is barred by limitation. But yes, the judge would ask, what is your explanation for delay and latches? So there has to be a specific uh, contention or specific statement of fact that why are you approaching the court after this much delay? And if you are in a position to explain 
the delay properly there is a sufficient cause for approaching the court after this much delay and if court is satisfied then court will uh, entertain your petition otherwise it, the court might dismiss your petition simply on the ground that not barred by time please bear it in mind petitions cannot be dismissed on the ground that they are time barred the discretionary relief can be denied on the ground that parties have said idle they were not vigilant enough to seek enforcement of their rights and therefore since this 226 petition is being a discretionary jurisdiction in the facts of the case since it is delayed by more than 2 years we do not think it proper to entertain this petition and therefore on the ground of delay and leches we are dismissing the petition so there is a distinction between time bar claim and a dismissal of a petition on the ground of delay and leches in a given case 3 days delay might be fatal and in a given case 3 years delay may also not be fatal so you just uh, keep this in mind that uh, this is uh, so far as claims are concerned they are governed by the law of limitation and so far as petitions are concerned they are not governed by the law of limitation so these are the basic distinctions and now so far as claims are concerned at the end of cpc i think there is a form a where different kind of formats are prescribed for drafting of a particular type of claim if you are uh, suing for immovable property then there is a separate format if you are filing a, a recovery suit then there is a separate kind of format prescribed in the cpc so there are different types of format prescribed at the end of cpc at the in the chapter a of the cpc whereas for petitions there are no formats except now because of the judgment in balwant singh chopal's case ai 2010 supreme court i think 2550 every high court here was directed to uh, frame rules pertaining to public interest litigation and by virtue of those rules now so far as public interest litigations are concerned there is a specific format prescribed under the public interest litigation rules so your petition if you are filing a public interest litigation it has to be in that format otherwise in so far as petitions are concerned you are free to evolve your own method you can apply your own imagination and make a best draft of a petition but you i just since time is now very short 5 minutes are left out so i will just take you to the uh, basic parts of petition so that you can compare these parts of petition with the plain what are the parts of the plain so parts of the plain is basic facts so facts are to be set out cause of actions are to be set out then uh, then uh, valuation aspect is to be set out and then prayer clauses to be set out and there is one more requirement of furnishing address of the defendant and the plaintiff so this kind of requirements are basic requirement documents are not supposed to be annexed as annexure a b c but they are supposed to be produced as a uh, document list d which is known as d list but so far as the petitions are concerned they are to be marked as annexure a b c d or whatever you may choose p annexure p1 p2 p3 etc etc and if you are filing a reply to the affidavit so petitions are decided on affidavits whereas in a suit it is a full fledged uh, adjudication adjudicatory process where not only plaint and uh, written statements are to be seen but the documents forming part they are to be proved and if the documents are proved then their effect will have to be seen and then oral arguments examination in chief cross examination and sometimes re examination and thereafter oral arguments takes place and thereafter judgment is delivered and it is followed by a decree that is a system so far as civil suits are concerned but so far as the petitions are concerned the drafting format is totally different first of all there is a cause title where you will have to describe which provisions of constitution are you are invoking that is first requirement that if you are filing a petition invoking article 226 you must state that it is a petition under article 226 of the constitution of india or if you are filing a petition under article 227 it must indicate that it is a petition under article 
sometimes uh, people write it is a combined petition so some portion pertains to 227 and some portion pertains to 226 so they may write that it is a petition under article 226 and 227 of the constitution of india then under which law the petition is arising because the high courts are functioning by the roster fixed by the chief justice you are all aware that in high court variety of cases come like land laws matters so it has been assigned to a particular judge criminal matters criminal appeals are assigned to a particular bench bail applications are assigned to a particular bench or a judge and then washing matters other matters are assigned then service matters are assigned to a particular judge so your cause title also must indicate as to matter is arising under which law whether it's a service matter or non service matter whether it is a land laws matter or it is a matter arising out of the of the municipal laws like municipal corporation act municipalities act or town planning act etc etc or there may be other statutes also so second aspect which should be stated in the petition is that you are invoking which law so when you write this the registry will be able to decide uh, before which judge this matter is required to be listed when it is to be listed so that is a very important fact so far as petitions are concerned and, and one must keep it in mind and usually the uh, advocates do keep this in mind and uh, second aspect is that if you are saying that particular orders are violative of article 14 16 and uh, 19 or 21 then you should also write after first you have written that it is a petition under article 226 or 227 you can say that it is for seeking enforcement of article 14 16 21 300 capital a whatever may be the case then what is the law which is you are invoking so that registry is in a position to decide before which judge it is to be placed and the next thing which i would recommend which may not be mandatory but you should also give brief description of the challenge what is the order under the challenge in the cause title itself so that when judge reads this petition at your home he will have an idea that what kind of what kind of order is impugned in the petition and then he will immediately go to that order uh, and he will have a clear idea he may not be required to read the entire petition this uh, mention of this order impugned order in the cause title will immediately give an idea to a judge and he will directly go to that otherwise he will have to search in the petition which order is impugned sometimes lawyers are so careless that they even don't mention which annexure is uh, which order is impugned and it is at which annexure or page number so when judge reads the prayer what happens the, he says that be pleased to issue so and so so and so right to quash an order dated so and so so and so then it is not preceded uh, or uh, it is not mentioned uh, that uh, which is the annexure or what is the page number in the prayer clause so i would recommend that it has to be not only written in the cause title also but in the prayer clause you must distinctly state that the uh, the please to quash and set aside the order dated so and so of respond number so and so uh, in bracket annexure p1 or p2 whatever may be and page number also so that judge has judge may not have to waste his time to look at the impugned order so that is one more requirement in the cause title as well as the prayer then comes the other body part means who should be the petitioner who should be the respondent there are variety of disputes and differences or cases where whether a single petition Uh, more than one petitioner can join in a single petition when petition is to be filed by a partnership firm when petition is to be filed by a proprietorship firm whether it should be in, by the name of proprietorship firm or partnership firm whether it is when it is filed by a company who should be the petitioner and uh, who should be the respondent so it's a art whereby you will have to find out what kind of cause title is to be made who should be the petitioner it is also an important task who should be the petitioner So, so you should have a clarity and you should for guidance you must refer to the uh, provisions of cpc also and certain judgments whether more than one petitioners can join uh, in a single petition or not there the judgment of the allahabad full bench high court that is uh, 
state of up versus umesh chand which is reported in air 1984 supreme court page 46 where this issue has been very clearly discussed whether more than one petitioners can join in a single petition whether unregistered association can file a petition or uh, it need, needs to be a registered association all these things are discussed in this judgment then comes respondent how to describe the respondent in a civil suit there is a distinction i i forgot to mention in civil suit when you refer to the state of particular state or union of india under section 79 rate with order 27 mere reference of union of india is sufficient when he is a defendant union of india is defendant you need not join a particular department at all it is not expected from a litig litigant that he should know who is the concerned department it is to be named defendant if it is a union of india you the description union of india is sufficient nothing more and if it is a state then if you are from a state of madhya pradesh or state of gujarat or state of maharashtra then description is state of gujarat or state of maharashtra is sufficient because the government leaders are standing counsel for the state and if union of india is there then central government standing councils are there they are notified officers who are authorized officers of, to receive a copy on behalf of the union of india and state concerned and therefore the cpc simply insists that mere reference of union of india and uh, state is sufficient it need not be followed by which department or but if you are filing a petition against a particular officer also in addition to a, a union of india or a state of gujarat uh, or a state of madhya pradesh then uh, you need to give description of that authority also uh, as a defendant or a respondent so this is this you must keep it in mind because this kind of questions frequently arise if a trust wants to file a petition or a plaint then who would file because trust is managed by managing trustees a board of trustees whether all trustees are to be joined as a plenty for the respondents as the case may be or defendant as the case may be or managing trustee can file a petition or a plaint so all these issues which are required to be born by born in mind while drafting of a plaint or a petition in the petitions uh, the first respondent is usually union of india or the state as the case may be concerned state as i said that i am of the firm view that in petitions also if you give description uh, first respondent who is usually a nominal uh, uh, respondent that is union of india or state concern this description is sufficient but if you are because uh, the petitions stand on a different footing because you are challenging the order of some authority then that authority also needs to be joined by a specific designation and if you are making allegations of mala fide then that person should be joined by name also so these are the requirements of a petition before the high court under article 226 but it may not be strictly required so far as the plaint is concerned so you should be very clear as to who should be the respondents if you are seeking certiorari earlier law was that or even law today is that that quasi judicial authority your tribunal should be joined as a respondent because that is the authority whose record is called for for examining and then if it is not found proper then by writ of certiorari it is posted and set aside so uh, tribunal or quasi judicial authority needs to be joined as part of respondent or not it is also a very important issue and for that i would request all of you to read the judgment of the supreme court which is reported in 2015-9 SCC page one, that is Shri Jogendra Singh Ji Vijay Singh Ji versus State of Gujarat, where the issue was whether uh, if in a petition under Article 226 seeking certiorari, if tribunal or court is not joined as a party respondent, whether letters patent appeal means intra court appeal would be maintainable or not. That was the issue, and the Supreme Court said that it is not a mandatory requirement, and the maintainability of letters patent appeal does not depend. on the fact whether tribunal was joined respondent or not so all these things uh, are to be borne in mind and then very quickly 5 minutes i will just take what are the parts 
first part is facts statement of facts then second part is legal submission so uh, the plaint and petition differs on this point also in plaint you are not supposed to make legal submissions whereas in petition it is a combination of suit and it is combination of special jurisdiction and therefore when you are impugning a particular order of the authority you need to point out on what ground the order impugned is uh, flawed and what are the basic infirmities in the order so legal submissions are to be there in the petition but they are not supposed to be mentioned in the plain so after legal submission there is a mandatory paragraph about the prima facie case balance of interim relief purpose so third paragraph would be interim relief whether you are seeking interim relief what kind of interim relief and whether what kind of prima facie case there is a tendency that every lawyer would simply write that there is a prima facie case balance of convenience and if the interim relief is not granted the petitioner will suffer irreparable loss but then no description is given as to how petitioner has prima facie case so brief description is necessary in this paragraph about how there is a great prima facie case in favor how balance of convenience is in favor of the petitioner and how irreparable loss is likely to be caused if interim relief is not granted that is required to be set out very clearly in very brief manner not elaborately so this is a, sometimes it is considered to be usual paragraph stenographers are uh, simply uh, writing this paragraph so formal paragraphs are written by stenographers the lawyers simply uh, dictate the statement of facts and then legal submission but you should also take care in writing this paragraph then third uh, fourth paragraph would be whether alternative remedy is there or not because uh, these are discretionary jurisdiction and therefore if there is alternative remedy uh, the high court would not usually exercise the jurisdiction and therefore you must give reference whether alternative remedy is there and whether you have exhausted alternative remedy or not so that is the fourth paragraph then uh, next paragraph would be whether on the same subject matter whether any other petition is filed or any other case filed or pending before the court because there is a principle known as doctrine of res sub judice incorporated under section 10 of cpc that if some litigation is pending usually no second litigation on the same point should be encouraged and if it has already been decided by some authority whether it would operate as res judicata or not all this is important and therefore this statement is also mandatory in every high court that you must make a statement that there is uh, uh, whether you have filed any case in the any other court tribunal or supreme court and whether it is pending or not and then the prior clause so these are the broad aspects of the uh, drafting of a petition and plain we i have already pointed out the distinction and as i said so at the cost of repetition again so this is an art and it would require great love for this art if you want to have uh, expertise in drafting if you want to excel in the profession you need to have both the skills that that is a writing skill and oratory unless you have this both these are indispensable and uh, for excelling in this profession the writing skill as well as oratory is most important and i think this is sufficient for today's uh, session i thank you mr vikas chatrat for giving me this opportunity to share my views of course uh, it was uh, the time was little short otherwise i would have uh, gone into details of other aspects also but uh, i wanted to cover very briefly every aspect of the drafting not only just drafting as a skill but what are the tools of the drafting what is the importance of drafting and what are the distinctions between the plain drafting of a plain and petition so i have just try to cover every aspect in a very brief uh, 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 statement before uh, this web uh, session and i thank you mr chatrat for giving me this opportunity i think uh, this is sufficient yeah. uh, uh, i can just say that once you said that it was not a sufficient time we can say i am remi reminded of the famous dialogue it says ye to bhi mere ट्रेलर है मेरे दोस्त पिक्चर तो अभी बाकी है तो वी कैन कंटिन्यू टू टेक इनटू डिफरेंट पार्ट्स एंड इफ यू से दैट एक्चुअली दिस ड्राफ्टिंग एटसेट्रा इज सच अ वाइड स्पेक्ट्रम टू ब्रिंग ऑल दिस इनटू वन कैनवास ओनली रिक्वायर्स अ स्किल इवन टू डेमोस्ट्रेट एंड सब्सटैंशिएट दैट व्हाट इज रिक्वायर्ड फॉर ड्राफ्टिंग एंड एज यू राइटली सेड इट्स अ बर्ड आई व्यू वेयर पीपल कैन एक्चुअली गेज इट व्हाट इट हैज टू हैपन एट 
only practice and you have to the practice makes the habit as they as they often they say that it is it then bit a bit then a habit so to cultivate a habit of doing better practice can only be uh, it's just like a reflex of the muscles you have to practice more and then you automatically react right or what we say because in the drafting you also tell our associates to the effect it is more like a cricket game or a football game that you have to improve your reflexes understanding what the other side can do so similarly is what you visualize at the first instance what the other party can do and he has to contemplate all this then uh, he says uh, first lot of people have asked kindly share the judgment so we will request uh, kindly share the compendium of the judgments he one says uh, how to master in writing the well draft as i i said that uh, maximum reading and uh, clarity of thoughts and clarity of facts once you take instruction from uh, your client you arrange your documents properly and you write down the sequence of events that is most important once the sequence of events is arranged properly you would be very fluent in drafting your plain or petitions so that is the way how one should draft i always insist my colleagues to write down one important aspect that prayer must be written down with hands that will impart clarity once you are clear that what you want from the court then automatically uh, everything would be clear so i would request that uh, sequence of events you must write down with your hands and the prayer clause you must write down with your hands so that there is clarity manoj kamra uh, says is legal notice mandatory for a public interest litigation having already sufficient rta replies uh, it is not mandatory but usually when we file a public interest litigation we insist for enforcement of a statutory duty by someone some authority who has failed to neglect or failed or neglected to perform its duties discharge its constitutional obligations or other kinds of obligations then in that event uh, you should at least demand performance of the statutory duty because essentially you would be demanding mandamus read in the nature of mandamus and their insistence of demand and refusal thereof or inordinate delay in uh, replying to your demand that will give you a cause for a filing a public interest litigation otherwise public interest litigation always you think what kind of public litigations are filed usually that municipal corporation is not doing this these parties are not um, uh, jeep, uh, uh, this pollution control boards are not checking the pollution so essentially they are seeking enforcement of statutory duty or constitutional duties and therefore it is necessary that you at least demand enforcement and if there is refusal or inaction then it is necessary it may not be a notice like section 80 notice but at least uh, the authority must be put to notice so that is the answer uh, this is can a person one person file a writ petition as a party in person where two other petitioners are involved um, i think uh, three petitioners are there three and one is a one he says that he wants to file in person i believe that see if such a situation is there he can appear for himself and so for others are concerned i am it is doubtful because he is not a lawyer and whether he could be authorized by two other persons to represent their case because only lawyers have a right to practice otherwise everyone will do like that so i have a serious doubt so far he himself is concerned if the the high court rules permit my party in person is allowed to appear then he can appear for himself but so far as other petitioners are concerned even if he possesses an authority to appear on their behalf it would be short of uh, it will not be permissible because otherwise advocate sec would be redundant everyone would give an authority and he will appear that is in only authorized representative there is lawyers who are given licenses are entitled to appear yeah and in so far as the joint writ petition is concerned that 87 supreme court is also there which says that a joint writ is maintainable an pathak uh, an pathak versus an pathak versus yes yes 87 which says 
Hmm. And Prabodh Sharma also deals with that factor in the promotion where it says you need not complete everyone, but a representative capacity can be completed. Yes, Prabodh yes, Sharma. Yes, yes. That also comes. And DS Nakara's case also, all the pensioners, it was filed on behalf of many pensioners, but it was uh, not a registered association of the pensioners. But despite that, uh, the Supreme Court entered it. So there are, I think, a large number of judges, but these issues have not been directly dealt with. They have been entertained. So merely beer because they are entertained, you cannot argue that it's a precedent that uh, more than one person can file a petition and it has to be entertained. But uh, so far as judgment of the Allahabad High Court, that is the state of UP versus Mission, which is I think reported in AI 1984, Allahabad, page 46. That gives complete answer. And there is a judgment of the Gujarat High Court, uh, which is reported in 1975, GLR page 368. That is Chatur Bhai, Dinesh Bhai Patel versus State of Gujarat. He, he, that judgment says that if the grievance is common, if parties are uh, aggrieved by a common order, common notification, or common uh, inaction, then in that case, all the parties can join. And uh, joint petition by more than one person is maintainable. And if it is unregistered association also, there may not be problem. Only thing is that uh, suppose unregistered association files a petition, there has to be uh, the authorization by all the members that he is permitted to file in the name of the uh, unregistered association, though it has no legal entity. But in petitions, all these uh, technical technicalities are not uh, even that much importance. Court is more concerned with the enforcement of fundamental rights. But I think in a large number, the law what has traversed, uh, may maybe I can stand corrected, it says Let's assume somebody files on an unregistered organization. And mm -hmm. let's assume that red petition stands dismissed or a suit stands dismissed. So it cannot bound down the other persons. So that area is there. And now the law yes, is developing yes. that it should be preferably yes, registered. Therefore, I say that it should be backed by the authorization of all members of the unregistered association. That, okay, you file it in them, not through the elected member by us, and it will bind us. If that kind of authority is given, then probably that. But sometimes it so happens. Some somebody files old retire uh, old association, retiree association, welfare yeah. association. So it has its own challenges. Right. So right. thank you, Mr. Pandya. It was a quite fascinating session. Thank, thank you. Very and the much. way it has picked up on the YouTube, I, I, it gives a teaser to the effect that people will actually cherish it for all times to come. Thank you, everyone. Thank stay you. safe. Thank you. Stay blessed. And on Sunday, do stay connected with us. Uh, we have acting chief justice from where Mr. Pandya is there, uh, Mr. Vineet Kothari, and a former acting chief justice of Madras Bar Association also, who will give us the procedural aspects of the Arbitration Act, and that will be bilingual, that is Hindi and English combination. Do stay connected with us at 6 p.m. Everyone stay safe, stay blessed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.